Hello, everyone. My name is Austin Belzer from the appropriately named Austin B Media, um, and I'm here today with the director of the uh, feature film Medusa, which is screening at AFI Fest this week. In fact, it's screening November 13th in the uh, TCL Chinese Theater um, as part of AFI Fest 2021. Um, and Anita, how are you? I'm fine. I'm uh, in Brazil now, in Rio, but I'm super happy that the film is screening at AFI. My other film was also there a few years ago. At that time, I was able to go. So it, the festival was amazing. So I'm really happy that the film will play there this week. Yeah, and I mean, it's kind of this big resurgence. I know you were at um, Cannes, the director's fortnight there. Um, but um, where, where I think that was kind of the big kind of return to the physical festival. Um, and while we're on the subject, how is it going to Cannes? I, I know that's the big festival everyone likes to talk about. Uh, it was an amazing experience, but I think especially this year because at least in Brazil, the pandemic was so crazy, it was so hard on us. And for us to be able to attend Cannes, we had to do a 10 days quarantine before the festival. Mm -hmm. So before we had to, first we have to get a special travel permit from the France government. And yeah. then I, I arrived in France two weeks before the festival. I, I stayed 10 days inside a friends of mine apartment in Paris. So when I arrived there in Cannes, I was, I was, I was coming almost from an isolation in Brazil. I was only leaving my home basically to work in the post-production of Medusa because the pandemic was at that point very awful still in Brazil. So then I was 10 days locked in an apartment in Paris. Then when I arrived there, I was like, wow, I was just the, the compressing and just being able to go back to the movie theaters was an amazing experience. The festival was testing us every 48 hours. So everybody yeah. felt very safe. But for me, it was very exciting to be in Cannes, but especially in this moment, because I was just very grateful to be able to be there, to be watching films again, to be interacting with people, almost like in a fantasy life. Yeah. So it was amazing to premiere there. But I think the, the most awesome part was being in a film festival again and yeah. being in a movie theater again at that point was like, oh my God, I was missing so much watching films in the movie theater. So it was an amazing experience. Yeah, it was funny. I was um, in, I had to travel for a uh, press screening for uh, French Dispatch. Um, and the press rep there um, was just like elated, like, ah, oh, we're, this is our first big screening um, of post pandemic era was uh, French Dispatch. So, so it's kind of, it was nice. Um, being back in a theater again. A shame I can't be there, but, um, you know, Anita, um, I think we we're talking little circles because I, I, I haven't even introduced the film yet. So <laughs> what, in your words, is Medusa about? Oh, my God. So for <laughs> me, <laughs> let me see. <laughs> Medusa is a horror film, but also a fantasy a comedy and a musical that talks about Mari, a girl that grows up in a very conservative environment. That that's the world that she knows, and she'll and she'll be faced with some transformations. She'll be confronted with actually with the loss of control because she's someone that grow up having to control herself very much, and, and also since she have to control herself, she starts to control everything around her. But sometimes things get out of control and she'll have to deal with some transformations and, and maybe so something like that. But the film about the control and the lack of control and, and to be able to lose yourself and to be who you want to be. Yeah, and you know, we, I think, you know, I like to go into films knowing uh, little to nothing um, because it was funny, somebody asked my review process, uh, and I was like, what do you mean? I just see a title, and then I see a photo, and then I go see it. Um, but um, so when people see the title Medusa, there's a certain image, I, I think, that's conjured in the mind that of the Greek goddess Medusa, um, which is kind of addressed here. Um, so where did this 
modern take on the Medusa storyline come from? Uh, for me, it has two reasons. The first one was around in 2015. I started to read a lot of articles uh, here in Brazil about girls ganging up to beat another girl. I read one about four teenage girls that get together to beat another girl that they consider promiscuous. And, that, and it has a lot of to do with the social media, the photos she was posting. And it was very important to this group to make this girl look ugly, to cut the hair short, to, to cut the, the face. And then some weeks later, I, I, I read a similar report in another city in Brazil, this time with girls about 20 years old. And then I started researching. And I found not only in Brazil, but in other countries, some reports of girls ganging up to be another girl. And in Brazil at that point, we're facing this conservative rise. Every day, the ultra right was taking more power. Then there was Dilma impeachment. And so, but this news about girls ganging up made me remind Medusa myth, because the first part of the myth was that Medusa was a very pretty priestess that worked for Athena in Athena temple. And then one version of the myth, she was raped, the other she had sex. But for her, not since she was not more poor, Athena transformed her into this horrible creature. So I really want to talk about how the sexism, how the machismo is part of the structure of the society. So that was one of the reasons. And the other thing is this image of the Medusa, but it's a little bit a spoiler of the film because this image of the Medusa is screaming. Because when you think about Medusa, we think Caravaggio Medusa, and she's always screaming, but she's yeah. screaming very angry. She's not afraid. She's like pissed. She's like, oh, she's angry. And for me, uh, there's a part of the film that's about that, about uh, releasing, uh, put, putting out there this anger to maybe to move on is a way like to turn on the page, to, to scream, to put out that, all this anger, all this fury that sometimes grow up as a woman, some, you have to keep inside yourself. So there is these two <laughs> motives for the Medusa. Yeah, that's actually just before I hopped on here, that's I think where I left off about hour 39 in. Um, um, ah, you didn't watch it to the end? I'm not finished, but oh, no, so. <laughs> I've got it up in this uh, window over here on my monitor over here. Okay. Um, um, but, you know, you talk about this um, social media, um, I guess, advent, and the first image, I don't know if this is a spoiler. They're, they're the woman in the beginning, um, do this kind of confessional with the smartphone. You see it multiple times throughout the film. Um, and it's all, all via the smartphone. Um, and it, it, they, the smartphone plays a pl prominent role in the movie. So how did you feel about smartphones taking a role in this cultural conversation that the movie's trying to have? Ah, the, the main characters, they are around 20 years old. So the smartphone is part of their lives. Uh, it's, and, and also, for, for example, another, another inspiration for the film was the ultra-right YouTubers that they are everywhere here in Brazil. And social media has a great part in the ultra right rise here in Brazil. So for me, and I don't know, Brazil is after the US, the country that most use Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. So people, even, is, even being a country that don't have so much, so many access to technology, is it still the country that people most use after the US, the social network. So Brazilians are crazy about social networks. So talk in a film, talk about people 20 years old, there's no other way. The smartphones are always in their hands. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's part of the day-to-day -day life and the way they, they perceive the world. Yeah, and I mean, go on any app store and there's special versions of, you know, Facebook, Instagram, where it's, um, I forget what they call them. I think not Facebook Go, something like that, but where it has access to news and all that stuff. Um, and um, so there's a, a bunch of color in this film. Even in that first uh, shot we see of the woman uh, dancing um, on the smartphone. And uh, so I, what would you say um, uh, color plays a role in the film? Yes, no, I like choosing colors. I like to portray a world that's not life at ease. That's a word that I, I like to create images, not what we're going to see in the day-to-day -day life. 
uh, for this, this film, we were especially inspired by some filmmakers from the 70s, like Brian De Palma, especially Dario Argento in Suspiria, that really used colors in the set. In my first feature, we didn't use so, so much colors in the set. We use only the color grading. So when me and the DP, Juan, we are thinking about Medusa, we really want to go to the set and use, and use the colors there and create this hyper reality. So I start to think about the green as the color of the Medusa, of the nature, of the snakes, and the red in opposite of it. It's like red, that's also the color of blood and the... So it's a film with a lot of colors. And uh, for me, I like to, to create a, 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 a visual elements that are different from the day-to-day -day life. And uh, also, especially since the film is inspired by things that are going on in Brazil, I think creating this visual aspect is a way to make it easier for the Brazilian audience to watch, make it more distant to reality and also the use of humor from here, two ways of making it a little bit, bit more easy for the audience, especially the Brazilian audience, since it's very much inspired by things you are, you are living here in Brazil. And, you know, it's, it's funny you mentioned Dario Argento because another filmmaker I interviewed for another festival, the Austin Film Festival, um, he's the director behind It Hatched. Um, he actually said kind of a similar thing where he was, I don't know if you've heard of it, um, but check it out if you get the chance. Um, it's an Icelandic horror film about this couple who moves to Iceland and has a baby who is also a demon, and it, it's wild, but it, it's fantastic. Um, but um, speaking of that inspiration, um, the, the score here is this kind of, I, I don't know how to describe it, uh, describe it, it's more, I would Describe it as techno retro in a sense. Um, there's a lot of synth, there's a, some piano, and it, it feels like a movie, like you said, that comes out of the 80s. Yeah, it's all, it's all made in computer, it's all synthetic, the, the diegetic soundtrack, and we were inspired by the by the, me and the Bernardo Zeda, the, the one that did the, this, the more background soundtrack. He was inspired by Goblin, Tangerine Dream, Carpenters, Carpenter, so that's what uh, we are inspired by these films by the 70s and the 80s. That's what we're trying to play, uh, some, some time of homage to these filmmakers and films that we really love. It's a soundtrack that has many aspects because there are also the other songs, but for the climatic songs, he was pretty much inspired by these films from the 70s, 80s, I think especially Carpenter. And, uh, and yeah, he made everything in his computer. We didn't have the money. It was all made at home with one computer. <laughs> and, yes. Yeah, and you know, it, it, it's it's funny because we're trying to, like, I watched the new Halloween, um, Halloween Kills or something like that. And I didn't even think about it while watching, but yeah, it is very car uh, Halloween-esque almost. Um, especially um, the scenes with the uh, girls in the choir. Um, forgive me, I don't, I don't uh, remember the name off the top of my head. Um, and, you know, um, the choir scenes are some of the best scenes in the film. In fact, there's almost, at one point, I think they almost sing, I don't know, I forget what song it is, but it, it sounded like a Vietnam era song. No, um, no, there is one that's a version of House of the Rising Sun. Yes. Because it. it's a public domain song. So that okay. was one of the reasons. It's a public domain. And I want to use a song that everybody would recognize. Like it's something familiar to me. And so we made a research for public domain songs. And this song is a, actually this version, not the, the animals version because it has the bass, but the, the more, this version that's a little bit more basic is a public domain version that from, I don't know, more than 100 years ago. Okay, I'm glad I'm not the only one who thought of that because I'm like, no, this sounds like a song I've heard. And, you know, there's a bit of satire to the film. Um, yeah. Especially in those scenes, um, which is funny because when I was writing down the genre, and I wrote down horror satire, I was thinking, 
how is this going to work? How do you make something scary and then make something funny? But you seem to balance that very well. I like Panic in the 90s. It was pretty much that. But for me, it's very difficult to define a genre for, for the film. For me, uh, it's horrible when you have to put one genre. I really like working mixing genres. Like a filmmaker that really inspired me is David Lynch, that we were watching okay. his film. Sometimes it's so scary. Sometimes it starts laughing. Then there is a song. Then there's a melodrama. I really like uh, this when filmmakers are changing the genre during the films. And uh, I don't know, maybe because in Brazil it takes so long to do one feature and then the other. So we have to put everything there. I really like mixing genres. Sometimes we have, but we have to define something. So some places people put horror or the, or just horror satire. So yeah, but we have to define, but I hate having to define a genre of the film. Yeah. It's something, for me, it's a mix of genres. Yeah, it's like little ingredients where you're like, okay, I've got 50 ingredients, but now I've got to narrow it down to one, one main yeah. dish. Um, and, you know, go, going back to um, that, there's been a lot of positive response to the film. You know, you've had quite a long festival circuit for this film um, since Cannes. I mean, Cannes was, what, March or something? No, it was July. July. Okay. Well, that shows how quick time goes in the festival circuit. But um, no, um, everywhere I look, people are just praising the film. So how does it feel when, you know, this is your second film and it's getting all this positive feedback? How does that feel? Uh, I'm super happy and honored. It's a film that uh, we took, I took many years to, we took many years to finance here in Brazil. And even was a very low budget film because Brazil was like, uh, we used to have politics for making films here. Now we don't have any more. So it's a film that the total budget, now it's, it's very low budget still. We shot it in 28 days, days in, in November, 2019, just before the pandemic. And then there was a pandemic. So I don't know. I. I'm happy, but it was like years working the script, then a lot of time think a way to shoot with the money we had, then we, then we start editing, then came the pandemic. So I don't know, I'm happy that the film is traveling. I'm happy now it will be launching in the United States and Canada by Music Box. I'm, I'm happy that the film is traveling. I'm happy that people will be able to watch the film. It's, as a filmmaker, what you most want is that the film get to the audience. It's terrible when the films disappear. So I'm, I'm super yeah. happy. That's in very, this very complicated year still with a lot of films that Medusa is going well and being seen. I'm very happy about that. I just want to point out two insane things you just said. One, you say you have no budget, but it looks no, like... A very low no, I can make the calculations. It's around... Uh, we sh the total budget total is around 60... Six, it's around half a million dollars, basically. Okay. That's we shot it with, with two hundred thousand dollars. Yes, but of course in Brazil, wow. it's, of course now the dollar is super undervalued comparing to the Brazilian coin. But we shot with that, like in in four weeks. I, I shot five six scenes a day. We are we was super crazy. I rehearsed a lot That's a long time. Insane. Me and the DP and the production design team we planned everything. But it was a set that. If it rains, it was it couldn't rain. We didn't have the money to anything goes wrong, get wrong. It was very, it was a very, it was low budget even for Brazil, but the, it was in a point that all the funding stopped here. And we made the decision, let's do with what we got and thank God because two months later was the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> so the pandemic would be much more difficult to shoot. So it, yeah, it was a very low budget even for Brazil, the film. Yeah, I mean, I would not have guessed half a million. I would have said at least 20. No, but it was our one of our goals to even with not having the money to make to have some production value into it to to uh, to make it look expensive. It was one of our main goals. We didn't okay, we don't have the money, but let, let's pretend we have the money. <laughs> well, it, it, and we got it, some it, support like we got almost for free and amorphic glances with a friend of my DP that rented almost for nothing. A lot of people help out us. 
even so that the post-production company is a co-producer of the film. A lot of people come together to help the film to come true. Well, that's that's fantastic. I, I mean, I can't even imagine doing all that in 28 days. I, I mean, geez. Um, but, you know, so it's screening at AFI Fest. Um, and I know you've got distribution through Music Box. Um, so where can people, if they're not at AFI Fest, if they're not going to Los Angeles, where are they going to be able to catch this film? I think Music Box I think they will be, uh, is about to be able to answer better, but I think AFI is also online. There is a part of the festival that is online. I uh, have yeah. this impression it's a hybrid festival. I don't know the territory, if it's over all the US or only for California. I don't know, but I think it's a hybrid festival. It's still this year, but I'm not sure. Uh, that's <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, I think I checked this morning, and this was and only, Lisa, you'll be able to, Lisa, you know, or Elizabeth, or every, anyone's from the music box, will be able to answer you better about that. I, I really don't know, but yeah, uh, no but problem. I think the festival is hybrid. I have this impression. Yeah, it's like it's weird because it's like eight films are showing and then all the rest is short films. Oh, really? Um, yeah, so it's like this split kind of thing um, where eight films are showing virtually and then the rest are all physically at Los Angeles. Okay, okay. At the TCL yeah. Chinese. Yeah, no, I really don't, I really don't know, but, but the film will be, uh, I think there will be another festivals in the US and the film will be launched next year. I think still in the first semester. So yeah, maybe not now, but I think soon the film will be, uh, will be at theatrical in the US in 2022. Yes, okay, next year, maybe in the first semester, maybe by summer, I don't know, but next year the film will be released in the US and, uh, and I hope much more people will be able to watch it. That's the- <laughs> Yeah. It would be amazing I, I to be releasing movie theaters. That's for that's yeah it's a film that uh of course there there are people that only be able to watch in the vod that happens and but being able to to be releasing some cities in movie theaters will be uh, will be amazing because the film that i made think about the movie theaters but yeah but one day you go to the vod and it's also a great aspect to reach a broader audience but being able to be in movie theaters that's awesome yeah i i kind of I'm kind of, kind of glad that it's showing theatrically because, you know, um, I saw, I don't know if this is a Brazilian movie, um, but I saw El Profugo, um, which is The Intruder. In oh, English. so it's Argentinian. Hmm? I think it's Argentinian. Okay. Argentinian. My bad. Um, and that, like, I was just on HBO Max the other day and I found out it would come out. And I was like, Oh, okay. I guess we're not doing any PR for that one after it came out. So that's kind of I know, so maybe disappointing. I'm maybe I'm, I'm changing the films. I, I saw one with the, a similar name that wasn't doing festivals with me now, but uh, now I don't know if it's the same. Let's see, Argentinian, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, um, Anita, I want to thank you so much for coming on. It's been uh, thank you, Austin. Yeah, it's been a true pleasure. And I, you know, uh, again, um, anyone who's going to be in Los Angeles um, or lives in Los Angeles um, can see Medusa on November 19th at 8.30 p.m., I believe Pacific time, in the TCL Chinese Theater on their sixth screen as part of the AFI Fest 2021. Um, so, again, thank you, Anita, so much for your time. I know it's going to be a busy week. Um, with all of this, I mean, I know I, I am, I'm going to be pretty busy. Um, I mean, I just watched um, compartment number six a few days ago. Um, and then I've got a few, few more to watch this week. So it's going to be, it's going to be a great festival, I, I really think. Yeah, no, the uh, department number six is a uh, compartment number six is a beautiful film. That one I watch in Toronto. It's one of my favorites of the year. So. Yeah, I'm happy to be with all these titles in AFI. And um, I will have, for, for those listening or viewing, um, I will have my review up on the 13th at 8.30 p.m. Pacific.
time. So, so with that, thank, thank you so much.